I want to welcome all of you to our, our Berkshire Cultural Resource Center uh, program this evening. And uh, I'm really excited uh, to have this conversation. It's actually a continuation of a conversation that started on September 16th in one of our courses, uh, Hostile Terrain 94, which is a year-long project that we are doing that revolves around uh, the mortality rate associated with the migration across our southwestern borders. And um, I'm, I'm really, really interested. I didn't get a chance to participate in that one, so I'm really interested to see where this one goes. I'm going to take a moment to introduce, I guess, myself. I'm Erica Wall here at MCLA, and I'm joined by um, three amazing people, uh, one of whom is uh, Denise Marconish, and she is the Senior Curator and Managing Director of Visual Arts at Mass Mocha where her curatorial projects include a multitude of important and monumental exhibitions, including most notably and recently Nick Caves until, along with an impressive list of others. And I'm sure there are a lot of exciting things she has planned that hopefully she might share with us this evening. But in addition to her curatorial work, she has taught at the University of New Haven, Stonehill College, and Rhode Island School of Design. So thank you for being here, Denise. Next with us is Vincent Valdez, and Vincent is recognized for his monumental portrayal of the contemporary figure. His drawn and painted subjects remark on a universal struggle within various socio-political arenas and eras. Valdez is from San Antonio, Texas. San Antonio, Texas. He received a full scholarship to RISD and earned a BFA in 2000. He's currently a studio fellow at Next Haven in New Haven, Connecticut, and his work can be found in collections at the Ford Foundation, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Museum of Fine Arts, Houston, the Smithsonian Museum of American Art, and the National Portrait Gallery, among others. And last, we have Adriana Corral. And Adriana Corral's installations, performances, and sculptures embody universal themes of loss, human rights violations, mem memory, and erased historical narratives. Her practice is rigorous and research-based, often driving her to work within the archives. Adriana received her MFA from the University of Texas at Austin and completed her BFA at the University of Texas at El Paso. She was invited to attend the 106th session of the Working Group on Enforced and Involuntary Disappearances at the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland in 2015. And Adriana also has a list of noteworthy residencies to her credit, including Artist, Artist Research Fellow at Archives of American Art and History at the Smithsonian Institution and artist in residence at the Joan Mitchell Center in 2018. So welcome all three of you. It's amazing and wonderful to have you here. And um, as I'd said, this is actually an opportunity we wanted to make available to the public to participate in this conversation that the three of you've had. We invited you because we wanted to really broaden the discussion around hostile terrain and incorporate uh, your practices and your research and the discussion that you have between the three of you. Um, I actually did get an opportunity to take a little snip at a uh, snippet look at what you had done and I noticed that um, you guys were just leading it on your own so I'm hoping that's what's gonna happen tonight. <laughs> Sit back and watch. So um, I just want to invite everyone and Veronica, our gallery manager, will actually put the link to uh, the first session that you three had that's available on the BCRC playlist. And if anybody wants to take a look at that, we definitely invite you to do that. But I am going to hand it over at this point to Denise and um, maybe let you start it off and we'll try and leave some time at the end for some questions from some of our attendees. How does that sound? Sounds good. Perfect. All right. Let's do this. Is Denise unmuted? Uh-oh. Sorry. I was like, I can't unmute myself. <laughs> Um, thank you, Erica. It's so great to, to be part of this and to continue the conversation with Vince and Adriana. I think 
um, yeah, you'll find that it easily flows conversation between the three of us. Sometimes we veer off topic. So if we're getting too deep and you want to like raise your hand when question time should start, just please feel free to interrupt us. Uh, <laughs> um, so I was trying to remember today, I think it's almost about four years ago when we all met because we met i think it was just the day after the last presidential election <laughs> or two days after uh, and i was in san antonio and i came over to the firehouse adriana you and i had met the year before and um and vince that was the first time you and i met and i remember at that time you were working on um you showed me in progress in the studio this giant drawing that you had done of an eagle and that's when we first started to talk about the project that you would end up doing at mass mocha for the show suffering from realness last year so that really um kicked off what was the start of very many conversations uh between the three of us um so i figured i would I would start with a bit of a whopper of a question for both of you, <laughs> which is because I think it's something that you both um, take to heart. And that is what, what do you see as the role of an artist in contemporary society? What, you know, I think the ways in which you both are looking at humanity and trying to reveal that through your work. So I wonder what you see as that responsibility. Who's going to start? You go, go for first. It. <laughs> I usually go first. Uh, you know, for me, I, I think it's really uh, about there's a there's a there comes a great responsibility um, for an artist. Uh, I think an artist um, is pretty much equates to a, a you know the role of of messenger, and for me, that's the very thing that has always uh, s struck my curiosities or my fascination with uh, the legacy of artists throughout world history is that it was the artists who have always been sort of um, like these social antenna, right? Providing sort of, um, it was the artists, songwriters, poets, writers, uh, painters uh, as, as um, sort of blips on the radar, right? Um, and, and I think that when I look back at the few artists that I really hold, have held cl close to me, um, you know, the ones that have really spoken my language, my visual language in a sense, it's those that um, were pushing the norms of what, what mainstream society um, perhaps was, was thinking about or um, not thinking critically I think more, more importantly, not thinking critically about. And so artists like Philip Gustin, Otto Dix, uh, George Graz, Bob Dylan, right? Uh, and so forth. I, I, I think for me, it has always been my quest throughout my life and career to function, to make work that functions as a report. This is my visual testimony uh, testifying to what I have witnessed what I see, um, what I observe in the world around me. Hey, Adriana? And I think mine is in a very similar vein in terms of documentation, because um, documentation is a form that we can look to our past, understand, um, look at traces in the past or a history or a narrative. Um, but I think also a role of the artist, too, is to call into question, to be critical, um, and, and observing with a very acute eye um, to kind of the, the past and the present and the future, um, and drawing those connections. And, and I think through having these kind of questions, they lead to uh, deeper understandings and, and, and then how do we, uh, or as for myself as an artist, how can I articulate that um, 
through the the images or the spaces that I can create um, to inform mm -hmm. and then also leave my own trace behind mm -hmm. or form of documentation. Um, but I think for me, that role is vital. And I think um, I can say for all three of us, these are the, the constant conversations that we're always having, right? Um, you know, you were just saying we were together almost four years ago, you know, and we have this little fire in our belly that it's how can we work synergistically to, to push these, um, either these, these works forward or have them on that platform. And I think that's what this, you know, getting to work with you did in, in getting to um, unveil Requiem. Yeah, I remember four years back, you know, having conversations with you guys, with the other artists that I was opening a show with in San Antonio and, and everybody sort of, you know, in this moment of complete and utter <laughs> despair saying like, well, how can I even make art now? And I remember saying, well, now it's more important than ever before. Um, and I feel like we, we say that <laughs> to ourselves all the time. And, and I truly believe that like all art is political um, in whatever way you look at those politics. But I wonder if, if you both can remember back to when you maybe felt that or made a first, the first works you made that had that you really felt like we're doing this, we're, we're bearing these messages for the public? Well, I, I think for me, um, you know, it, it's, it's also, what would really interest me more is taking your question and, and countering that, reversing it. So what role does the society have towards uh, artists, right? Mm -hmm. And so especially at a moment in time, like this uh, in the 21st century America, um, it's really extremely necessary to reflect back on the past 75, 125 years in this country where not only relegated to states like, the, like Texas or the southern part of the United States, but the United States as a collective society, why has there been this war against creative critical thought, right? Mm -hmm. uh, everything from the censorship of, of literature, um, art exhibitions, right? Why is there never really um, a budget, um, you know, an adequate budget in our public school system for creative thinking, for creative, um, creative output, right? And so I think that that um, goes hand in hand with um, looking back at, you know, maybe an earlier moment for me as a, as a kid, just trying to, you know, I was so curious about why things were the way they were in my classroom, in my community, um, in my city and so forth. You know, uh, you know I think there, I had a, a, for whatever reason, a, a very premature uh, awareness of what it meant to bear a social conscience. And, um, and I really, attribute that to my experience of sitting up on scaffolding, um, working in the housing projects, painting these murals that had, that were very much rooted in a social consciousness, right? Messages about people and for people. Um, it really triggered something in me that, um, you know, had, has um, made me compulsive, obsessive about finding various ways to make this work to be an extension of people, right? It was my way of connecting to the world. And uh, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, and I've never, I haven't looked back since then. It's, it's still very much that journey of, of considering the audience, of, of trying to find various ways to, um, you know, to, to speak to people through images. Mm -hmm. And you were how old when you started working on those murals? I was nine years old. Uh, it just and, uh, still baffles my, just like little Vince up on the scaffolding, like, 
you know, thinking about the political history, it's just like, it makes, I can see it. <laughs> wearing, wearing the exact same thing that he's wearing today, like, <laughs> without the glasses. Right. And more hair. And I was going to say more hair. But like, I like that you mentioned that idea of it's not the artist, but what, uh, what is society thinking? And it, like it immediately triggered like, okay, I think about Lenny Bruce. I think of sure. Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, bur burning of books. I think of the Nazi degenerate art show or the, the culture wars with the NEA and Jesse Helms and all of these moments where government decided that art was not worthy or dangerous more so. I mean, I think uh, going all the way back to 1926 with uh, Upton Sinclair's publications. Right? Yes, and the, the, the jungle, right? The government like literally targeted him. I mean, he was a public enemy. Uh, yeah. And, and it's amazing like reading uh, his writings, you know, a hundred years later, I mean, the guy wrote these things for today, for the 21st century. It is here full blown. I mean, what a, what a prophecy, what a vision, right? And that's the idea is to be an antenna when everybody else is so distracted by spectacle and political division and um, interruptions, you know, and entertainment, right? The artists have the responsibility to say, pay attention, mm -hmm. don't let your guard down. Look what's going on around here, right? Yeah. Uh, when you think about Sinclair Lewis's um, book, it, it, it can happen here. I mean, it's written about right now, the fascism will come to America in the form of draped in an American flag and disguised with a Christian cross. Here mm -hmm. we are. Yeah. Right? But when you allow uh, powers that be to reject art, to keep the masses disconnected from critical thought, here's what happens, right? Mm -hmm. We are all power, absolute power goes un entirely unchecked. And then we find ourselves as a collective society, society saying, how did we get here? If I had a dollar for every time I've heard somebody <laughs> ask that question in the past 12 to 24 months, you know, I'd have about a thousand dollars extra in my pocket. How did this happen? Mm -hmm. how, did it, how did we get here? You weren't paying attention. Yeah. The signs of all, the symptoms have been there growing, right? Festering, and now it's fully infected. <laughs> and I think that's one of the reasons why people are so afraid of the arts, you know, whether it's music, literature, visual arts, is because it is prophetic. Sure. Mm -hmm. And they don't, you know, it, where it's really not, it's talking about a time and we just keep repeating that same time over and over again, which you know I think is also a huge part of your work, Adriana, where you're looking back at history and, and these moments where history keeps repeating itself. Yeah, I mean, I keep looking at that cyclical, um, the cyclical nature of it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Adriana, I cannot help but think about you and your work every single time, especially in the past, uh, you know, two weeks about this new story, breaking story about these hysterectomies mm -hmm. occurring, right, and detention centers. This is an age. Old, this is an age-old problem. This is not something that's brand new. It's never happened in this country before. And I think about the work that you've been doing and the research. Um, so it'd be amazing to just like Denise said, to make these connections between past and present, especially when it pertains to brown bodies. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, and that, I mean, that stems deeply into the eugenics movement. Um, there's a great book by Alexandra Mina Stern, Eugenic Nation, mm -hmm. and she really, it kind of goes back into looking at those structures in even education, um, because these are all under that same umbrella education and taking tests and you know even the SATs like all of these are kind of under that umbrella of of the eugenic um, movement and and part of that was okay we will test them what are the IQs and then you know 
maybe it was a number of, uh, say, for example, uh, Latinos or, and Latinas where they would get reprimanded for something and um, maybe caught stealing something or uh, they had come in for a different procedure and they would perform either a hysterectomy without their even not knowing that that was happening. Um, and so I think it's important to look back at that um, history because we, we, we tend to, as Vincent <laughs> loves to say, um, we, you know, there's th this type of amnesia, you know, and, and we tend to forget um, until there are larger movements that are saying, hey, like at Stanford, how many parts of the school have been renamed because the, the eugenics movement was pretty, um, was, was pretty present there. Um, and so I think it's, it's reclaiming that as well and shifting that narrative and shifting the discussion and highlighting, you know, that the reality of it, not just who was, you know, quote unquote, the winner. So, um, oh, continue. Oh, no, it, that's good. Oh, I was just going to say, so what are some of the ways that you use your work to expose the, these cycles, to expose some of these ideas, um, to, you know, to, you know, broadcast from that antenna, as you said, Vince. Well, you know, I, I think the, uh, the strategies, my strategies um, in terms of constructing images is no different from the strategies of artists like James Baldwin, um, you know, uh, David Siqueiros, uh, Mexican muralist. Uh, I, I think that the, the, the true power behind um, artists and, and, and their work is that by employing um, these agencies of history, right, um, intersected with the contemporary um, what art really does in terms of connecting to other human beings is that it reminds human beings that this isn't, that you're not in this alone, right? These struggles have always existed, right? For centuries, for generations, mm -hmm. throughout civilizations and empires. But again, if you're not aware, uh, if you're not connected, if you don't have access to art, if you don't have access to literature, if you're not, if you come from a nation that teaches its society to not read, then this sense of helplessness is the only thing that, uh, you know, is, is, is going to be uh, the end result of, of, a popu of entire mass population, right? The mm -hmm. sense of like, I can't do anything to change this. I don't know. I'm just going to look this way and somebody else will have to figure this out. But again, that's the... Uh, by by sitting in here in the studio and working with these challenging subjects that confront <laughs> the viewer, right? In terms of uh, in terms again of, of history, of identity, of social political um, elements. You know, I think for me, all of those layers stacked one upon the other, and then sh slightly shifted so that it. Um, occurs through a contemporary lens, but well, that's my way of almost baiting in a viewer so that the viewer can recognize him or herself in the image they are seeing. You don't have to only be Mexican American. You don't have to only be, be uh, you know, part of a young generation in America. You don't have to be in 21st century America even, but the idea is to find ways to create an a, almost a universal arcing theme right throughout this work and that's the reasons that um, you know I'll use certain strategic techniques like black the, a black and white palette in order to distort time and place right mm -hmm. you can't really tell if this is nine, a scene from 1931 or 2020 mm -hmm. right and for me that's very much uh, not only a, a visual trick but it's my way of, of sort of commenting on 
that's how I feel. That's how I reflect on what it is to be a part of the American experience, right? There is such complete disorienting blurs. You know, it's sort of like a mirage to me. You don't really quite know what is real and what is myth, right? Um, and, and I think that, you know, the, the goal of this work for me has always been to um, make it as much personally connected. Um, you know, I'm, I'm invested in it pers as personally as I am socially and politically. I mean, I, I want to yeah, say, I like, just... I think that's really evident in both, both your Thank you. Sorry, Dee. I was, I think I cut you off. That's, oh, no, I was just saying, I think that's so true for both of you. I, I feel like um, even just with this piece, Requiem, that we collaborated on, it, it really, the more that I think about it, it's like this monument, but a counter monument at the same time. Um, and and really what, what I'm also interested in when a viewer is in that space, there's this element of touch. Um, and, um, and, and tapping into the various forms of touch. Um, and that is, is usually illustrated through text that can be on the wall, that is, you're trying to decipher it. Um, trying to make sense of it. There's, it's imbued with so many different layers. Um, and I, I think like in terms of Requiem, it's really, it's a, it's a slow burn. It's you're unpacking it on so many levels um, from a formal level to a material level to then unpacking these dates that are surrounding it um, how they're carved from the wall, um, but also what is, what is, um, how are they withholding, how are they this, this capsule for this history? Um, and I, you know, I was just remembering too, Vince, you and I went to listen, um, I think it was the Suhail that, was it Requiem? To listen to it. I remember. Um, at the symphony, do you? Maybe we did. Uh, I hardly remember this morning, but I'm sorry. But, <laughs> but I'm, it, it sounds like us. I mean, I, I remember <laughs> with Requiem, there was, it was such an amazing project in terms of, of the timeline, right? It, it, that of its birth. I mean, it wasn't something as a project that um we thought of and then instantly got to work on it the next day there was so much so many different layers to navigate in terms of its production in terms of its pre preparation and planning uh, in terms of its collaborative elements and uh but i i remember um and we briefly touched on it the last conversation um denise the uh the subject of these these birds falling out of the sky yeah that's yeah. really what gave birth to that's really what sparked this idea well i remember when i came to the studio you showed me this drawing of this what looked like a dead eagle on its back and we were talking about reading these stories of birds falling from the sky and you said to me i had this this thought of like what would i do if an eagle fell from the sky this symbol of america what would what would that feel like in that moment? And I remember when you said that, and you know, I, I kept sort of following up with you guys, being like, "So," because you were like, oh, "I want to make a sculpture of it," and I was like, "Uh huh, tell me more, tell me more, like, like keep going, keep going." And and you know, and I love that it ended up, you know, starting with that that point, and then evolving to turn into a sculpture, to turn into a collaboration between the two of you but not just the two of you, with hundreds of other people living in America. Um, and I think that expansiveness, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the process of like, how you got to that point to then letting in all of these other people to contribute 
to the work by submitting dates of importance to them? Um, I can just briefly say like two, so, so that phenomenon of, of the birds falling out of the sky, I mean, for me, looking back, that's eight years ago. And in the year 2012, I think it, it really is a powerful testament to my feeling of desperation already in that year, right? Mm -hmm. On the heels of events in America like 9-11, like the coming um, um, climate crisis, right? The rising police state that I was seeing everywhere in this country going unchecked. Um, you know, the, the border hysteria on the heels of the Obama presidency about to occur, but uh, George W being in office. I mean, it was all tied in. These dots were all sort of sh very rapidly shifting and lining up. And, uh, and then I remember reading that story and seeing these images of those birds falling. And I just thought, wow, what a powerful symbol because it felt very much so in, in a visual sort of way of, of imagining if, if one had to, what would be the perfect ideal symbol to describe, to express where America was heading in 2012. And that's what I saw. And, and you know, speaking of cycles, I saw a news story recently, and I mentioned this in the last talk, that birds are falling from the sky yet again. Right. And I, I can't help but think about that corollary of cycles and how as difficult as it felt in 2012, I would so much rather be there yeah. and where we are right now. <laughs> but um, I think as drastically as things have changed just in the past eight years, the one thing that has remained true, summed up again in this one image of this collapsing eagle is that um, in 2012, it was the one way that I could summarize um, the sort of collapsing myth of who mm -hmm. we think we are versus the reality of what we really are, right? And so, it, it, you know, if one looks at that drawing or the sculpture, there, there's wounds, self-inflicted wounds with its own claws, right? It's its own worst enemy. It, mm -hmm. it caught in an internal struggle with its own self. Um, and I think eventually as it started <laughs> evolving as a project um, and morphed into a collaborative project, not only with Adriana, but with, um, 243 other Americans, I couldn't help but think about American, an, an American like Howard Zinn, historian, and his publication that really, you know, not only changed my entire perception of what I learned in the public education system in regards to history, um, but I thought about his publication, A People's History of the United States. That should be mandatory reading for every kindergartner in every school in this country. Um, because in that very first paragraph, in one swift, short paragraph, if people just took the time to read that half a page, it would completely throw you off course in, in regards to thinking about, wait a minute, this does not match up with what I've been taught and with what I've been told about the birth of this country. Mm. Um, I'll hand it over to Adriana. Well, now, and I think like, you know, with this collaboration, it was very organic, but it was, like these kind of conversations that we were, ha we're having right now and um, and constantly sharing books with each other um, and, and then having conversations about them. Um, Vincent had done a residency in Berlin and a year later I went and did one for a year in Berlin and you know I think when we met Denise is like I was coming off of the heels um, from that and it was also seeing another chapter of our history in you know in Europe and and also seeing another escalation of the migrant crisis and on the east and then coming back to the US and there was another huge wave coming into Texas and um, and that's something you know that Vince and I later went and did with a group of students going to McAllen and, and visiting one of the Catholic charities with Sister Pimental and, and seeing how, how they're in, constantly in movement. 
And I think the power of these kind of date and text submissions is it is it's it's a shared history that um, this this collective of of important and significant dates to individuals um, and some are quite gripping and some really illustrate um, the complexities of it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not like most of our history books that are discussing from one perspective. Um, but I think that's, you know, when you walk into like this kind of installation um, requiem, it allows you to sit with it and, and look at the vulnerability of our history and a need to understand it in a very different perspective, which is, you know, the conversation that we're having right now, like looking at Howard Zinn um, and, and so many others, um, but understanding what that does also to the body. And mm-hmm. I think what, you know, when you walk into that space and you're walking around the eagle, it's, it's bringing this kind of gravitational pull down. It illuminates almost um, like, a, like what you said, a meteor. It has this, the bronze kind of peering through the ashes that were uh, patinaed onto it, um, that were um, obtained from, from burning the dates and texts that were contributed. Um, but then you look to the wall that is, it's almost, it almost disappears in the space. And so I think that's something that Vincent and I also really tap into is this visibility, invisibility. And, you know, I'm brought to like even the strangest fruit, you know, you have, um, that could be really any city um, mm-hmm. and, or any landscape, but he's removed certain parts of it, but you understand by either the draping of of some of the clothing or where the shoelaces are hanging. But I think to go to even the Eagle, Vincent has had such a strong interest in in the Eagle itself and this symbol that it, you know, Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to touch upon that. Well, I mean, someday this isn't the last of Requiem. I mean, when I went to this residency in Berlin in 2014, I think, um, it, it really, I had already completed the drawing in 2012. And so that idea was still brewing. Um, and I started thinking about a more expansive uh, representation of the eagle as symbol, as symbology throughout world, throughout time, right? And place. And so, when you look at, you can trace the eagle if you start digging um, throughout world history, it was, you know, the Romans, it was the main, a very similar uh, patterned emblem as used in contemporary America. Uh, all the way, you know, from, um, it can be found in, in um, many different civilizations, and, but it always almost, it almost always represented the same sort of notions of power, dominance, intimidation uh, and I'll never forget uh, going to see these historic um, sites based around the, uh, the third that are still remnant from the Third Reich and uh, I was walking into the uh, topography of Terror Museum and I spent all day there and as I walked out I'll never forget being so moved like an earthquake on my way out the door because there's this one last section of wall and in, in inscribed into the wall is this text in both German and in English. And I swear they did it on purpose just for visiting Americans because it said World War II caught, took the lives of an estimated um, you know, two and a half million people, three million people. Um, the Third Reich was responsible for X, X and X. And at the, in the very last sentence of that short paragraph, it read, only few other countries uh, in the 20th century, or I'm sorry, in the 19th, in the 20th century are, um, I'm sorry, no, I got that wrong. Few other countries have sort of um, parallel numbers in regards to mass genocide. 
and it listed the United States in regards to Native Americans. Mm. And that's where it ended. And I thought, never would you see that in the United States in a public setting as monument, right? I thought, wow, like that was Germany's way of just saying like, um, screw you, right? Like we're always so quick in this side to point over there, like the most evil of all human history, right? When it comes to the Third Reich, Germany, but never, rarely do we point fingers at ourselves, or right? mm -hmm. are we willing to look into that mirror, right? And acknowledge what happened right here in our own backyards, um, not too long ago. And, uh, and so someday the goal is to extend that series of Requiem and I plan to do a monumental series of probably paintings because sculptures will be very expensive, um, but uh, a dozen or so, <laughs> eagles as evidence of collapsing empires, mm -hmm. right? Empires, history re should remind us all that when you, when you really dig into history, uh, empires almost never fall from outside, right? They almost always collapse from within mm -hmm. and happen, and they collapse very swiftly and very quietly when people aren't paying attention. I like that you're like, I'm not making another sculpture. <laughs> now, Adriana, so the, the last thing I'll say, then I'll turn it over for some questions. Um, I think it is also really important that um, so much of, you know, of course, with the eagle and sculpting it, the hand is in that, but also so much of what you do is about your own hand translating information from place to place. So when you talk about, you know, um, gathering these dates and these texts from people and then burning them and then the patina on the eagle, but also all of those dates were hand carved into the wall. And I think part of that pull of that piece is just understanding that there's this transfer that happens that I think is, is so important to, to both of your work. But um, I wonder if you can just say a little bit about that process for you. Yeah, and I would say that goes with a lot of my works. There is such an enormous amount of time in hand in each work. Um, and like we're talking like this, you know, this piece mm -hmm. took a few years and it took even longer to just get to that point. Um, but in terms of of the physicality, um, even with the eagle, that um, it was all done by hand, and I and and so was the wall. And I think that also adds an a, another rich layer to this. Mm -hmm. um, and then casting it, it was cast in plaster, and then it was finally cast in bronze. Um, but from that and then the, the, the wall itself, it was um, getting, receiving a contribution, a date and a text and, um, and then me just sitting with it um, and unpacking it. And many times it was quite emotional and, um, and with whole, you know, holding that internally and then letting that go once I started carving. Um, but it was very much, I felt as though I was kind of tapping into, um, you know, when I was younger, I was a very avid and, um, competitive tennis player. And I almost had to revert back to those, those days of eating for inflammation or, you know, even doing yoga constantly, or it's the same when Vincent is doing like a very large uh, mural like painting and it's like okay what are the foods we need to eat what are, what do we need to also be mentally feeding ourselves and physically feeding ourselves mm -hmm. um so it doesn't just become about this you know we're in the studio constantly but like how are we taking care of our bodies in order to you know really uh, bring this work to life um because it on one layer, it's okay, it's carving out each of the dates, but then it's arriving to Mass Mocha and working with a whole team of people to um, 
put these essentially um, sheetrock panels all together and to make them look seamless mm -hmm. um, with Magic Mike, who is a phenomenal uh, tape and flute. <laughs> Magic um, Mike, not from the movie, but from <laughs> oh, the right. high fix walls and, and a master plasterer. Um. <laughs> and I think that that's something that Vincent and I have always, you know, we're right there with the people who are mm -hmm. helping us to extend and realize the work that is so important to us and, and learn from them and understand from them. And in my case, it was, I wanted to document Mike in that process as well. And then not only did it stop there, but um, then it was returning a year later uh, to do a rubbing of the entire wall. Uh, with paper and and um, that was like another layer and you know this kind of trace that we have of the wall and um, and the other important thing that I'll just say is um, so I took those that text that um, and the date um, carvings burn those I handed those over to Vincent and he um, Patina those onto the bronze eagle, um, and um, I don't know if you wanted to say anything about that. Thanks. Yeah, can I just say briefly one last thing? Uh, the time capsule. I, I really, I really feel that um, one of the most powerful, strongest aspects, unspoken aspects about the Requiem project was Adriana's process um, by hand of reducing these texts, these voices from, from the people, from common citizens and non-citizens in this country who are almost entirely overlooked, right? Because uh, overlooked by people in positions of power, right? This is a country, a democratic country where uh, de democracy is supposed to be uh, represented by the people and for the people. Rarely do we see that ever occur um and so for her to take those ashes and and hand them over to me so that they get applied to the actual sculpture you know i really see that sculpture as a um a real life urn right it forever embodies um the voices of the people if this country um you know does not survive um those voices go down together um, historically, right? Uh, as a society, as a family, as a unit, as a community. Um, and so it was the least that we could do as artists, as citizens, um, like those who have come before us, again, like Howard Zinn, like other important American artists who have fought the good fight for their fellow. Um, uh, you know, citizen and non-citizen, and it was it was our way of, for once, just trying to counter that notion that the people in this country have had their platforms entirely stripped away from them, regardless of whether they realize it or not. Yeah, um, it was a way of giving them uh, back their platform. Yeah, no, I think that's, um, and I think you could feel that in the piece. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to in case if anybody has questions. I don't see any in the chat, but that doesn't mean that people don't have questions. Yeah, no, I, I think probably just like the rest of us, we're just having a really good time listening to you <laughs> and talk about all of this. Um, until we get any, I, I just wanted to kind of touch on, um, I guess the conversation, it just such, it is such a wonderful addition to the conversation that we've been having with regard to hostile terrain, because I think, um, you know, within the art world, um, there are lots of different, it's amazing how we can all look at one thing and see something differently. But I think we spend so much time often looking um, at what's in front of us, yet we should really be looking at what's not there and what you are all discussing are the voids and how you've been filling 
those gaps, which I think is uh, it's so critical and it's so important. But more importantly, we get to see how artists work with curators to create these, not just these projects and these exhibitions, but these experiences. So um, I really, I appreciate that. And um, what we've always tried to do here is to create that transparency. So you've really provided um, all of that for us. But I, I wonder now, since we have this little, what, what are things that, um, you know, it sounds as though Requiem could go forever. Is there a possibility of a sequel? <laughs> I mean, is what, is, what, it, what are the projects maybe for, for all of you, or if there is anything that you have, even if it is far off, are there things that you have thought of or ideas of where you would go with this next or any extensions, even within your individual work that you would share with us that's come out of, of the work that you, you've done together? Don't you want to go? Um, well, it kind of touches upon, well, I guess a lot of what we're discussing, but also, um, you know, the hostile terrain. Um, and I think this kind of identifying um, the disappeared or those who have been murdered, um, which started early on for me this this inquiry and this understanding and asking those questions why how when who um and and cataloging that and so in looking into some of my earlier works it's i feel like i'm kind of coming full circle at the moment um by looking at these kind of practices that were happening during the 19 or 1890s all the way to like the 1930s of uh, these delousing kind of practices along the US Mexico border. Um, and so um, Which is interesting. We were just talking about Germany and how we are so quick to point the finger to them, but um, The US federal government had established these uh, delousing facilities along the U.S.-Mexico border where they were uh, all second-class citizens had to go through a delousing process and that often entailed taking a bath in kerosene, cyanide-based chemicals, or even Zyklone B. Um, and there's a great historian, Dr. David Romo, who has, has written about it, but um, I'm going in a little bit deeper and, and seeing how um, you know, the kind of chemicals, the kind of process, and um, it, it really ties into even our pandemic right now. Uh, there was a typhus scare and a, the Spanish flu, and so they were really placing the blame heavily on uh, Latinos and Latinas um, for being this, these uh, contagious carriers. Um, so many telegrams that I've read, one in particular, it's even in uh, the Suffering from Realness book, in some of the questions that Denise asked us, um, you had the, the mayor um, of El Paso writing a telegram to the Surgeon General in DC saying these dirty, lousy Mexicans um, are bringing in disease. And that rhetoric, again, is, is being echoed today. Um, and so, yeah, that is, that, that's kind of what is uh, keeping me um, up and, and looking at, again, that cyclicality and, um, and these kind of movement that's, movements that happen and how the, there is a, an exchange of information and how it has a local to national and global uh, transnational perspective. Nice. Oh, me? <laughs> I usually ask the questions. Um, <laughs> you know, I think my next, the next exhibition that I'm doing at Mass Mocha definitely um, plays off this and, the, and in particular these sort of cycles of history. And that's a project I'm doing with uh, Los Angeles-based artist Glenn Kino, and it's called In the Light of a Shadow. And it looks 
at the cyclical history of protest and revolution. Um, and he just released a, a new um, cover of U2 Sunday Bloody Sunday. And it's performed by this guy, Dion Jones, who is a young African American um, political activist who um, was protesting Breonna Taylor, George Floyd in LA, and was shot in the face with a rubber bullet and uh, an inch difference, and it would have killed him. Um, and so with his face swollen, he sang this song. And when you listen to the lyrics of Sunday Bloody Sunday and the refrain of how long must we sing this song, you realize that cycle is just repeating itself over and over again. Um, so, so Glenn has made a, a sculpture that is part of that video, but then he's doing a whole show in our building five that looks starts by looking at the parallels between Bloody Sunday and Northern Ireland, which is of course what the U2 song was originally written about, but the parallels between that and Bloody Sunday and Selma, and also looking throughout that whole history um, to, to bring that to our very present moment. Um, one of the things that the Rick Room has led me to uh, on the, actually on the heels of the city painting in 2015 and 16, uh, after the city led, gave birth to uh, what I was calling the beginning, the beginning is near chapter two, Dream Baby Dream, which Requiem uh, was a part of. Um, those two chapters have now led me to the third and final chapter in this American trilogy. Um, the third, the final portion of it is gonna be titled uh, The New Americans which is what I'm currently working on now in the studio. I've, for the past three or four years, I've been searching for and locating 21 Americans in the 21st century who are still fighting the good fight. So where Adriana took those ashes from the voices of people, I'm now giving, um, putting a face to, the act, to some of these um, common citizens who are scattered around the country, most are unknown to each other, but they are uh, united in their unique efforts um, to challenge and change the American landscape in the 21st century. So I've selected the first uh, six, I believe, which Denise is also a part of. Um, and I'm creating, at the end, I'll have 21 monumental portraits. They stand tall, like pillars standing amidst a crumbling society. They are individuals who um, are fighting for their fellow humans, not, not for fame, for power, for profit, but because it's simply still the right thing to do. Um, and so this to me, this series to me, these faces um, that are in the studio today at a moment in time like, like this are really um, the, the bit of encouragement that I need to, on a daily basis to just keep pushing forward, right? They give me hope. They are, uh, I want to use this series as an informative educational resource for, for viewers as a remind, to serve as a reminder that, um, that America is still worth fighting for. Right? It's not time to throw in the towel quite yet. And here's the living proof. I think that that is the perfect way to end our conversation. I want to thank all three of you for spending the time with us um, yet again to continue the conversation, which I think we probably need to again do in the spring <laughs> hearing from us. But I want to thank you, Denise, Adriana, and Vincent for um, sharing your thoughts. And again, that transparency behind process, practice, uh, motivation, uh, it, it really, it adds a lot to what we see and what we do and what we're inspired to do. So I appreciate all of you. Thank you. Um, be well, stay safe. And let me add that Vincent and Adriana are also gonna be our featured artists in the month of October and November. October, Vincent will join us on the 17th and Adriana will join us on November 21st. 
So the conversation continues. <laughs> I'll join us. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.